meeting of the Vermont Development Review Board to order. My name is Daniel Richardson. I serve as the chair of this board. The other members from my right are Rob Goodwin, Kevin O'Connell, Deb Markowitz, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Tom Kester. Okay, the first order of business for tonight is approval of the agenda. Uh, I'll make a motion either to approve the agenda or take any motions to modify that wish to be made. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion to approve the agenda as presented. Motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Second by Deb. All those in favor of the agenda, approval of the agenda as printed, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda for the evening. Um, I have a few comments from the chair. Um, one of our members, Ryan Kane, is missing this evening. Uh, that's because he's welcoming a new child to the family. And uh, on behalf of the board, I wish him and their new baby, Julia, the best of this winter season. Um, second issue is uh, I just want to simply put out there that I will be recusing myself from the second application uh, for tonight, the BCFA uh, permit application. The vice chair, Kate McCarthy, will take my place. Uh, but however, given that I will not be chairing the second half of the meeting, I wanted to make a few housekeeping notes. Our next meeting is scheduled for February February 4th, which is a Monday. Um, right now, we do not have any uh, items on the agenda, so it is likely that any items that will be in that meeting will be either issues that are not resolved tonight, or uh, we do have training on the new zoning regulations scheduled for the board that we'll conduct in a public hearing session, um, but there are no new applications currently, but the board will still be meeting. With that, uh, we'll move on to the next order of business, which I believe is the approval of the minutes of December 3rd and December 17th. The December 3rd <coughs> minutes include Kevin, Deb, Tom, and Rob, uh, who are all present, so we do have a quorum. Uh, do, we have, do I have a motion to approve the December 3rd minutes or any request to amend and then approve the minutes? So moved. Motion to approve by Tom. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, second by Rob. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the December 3rd meeting minutes that are eligible to vote, please raise your right hand. The December 3rd meeting minutes are approved. The December 17th minutes would include myself, Kate, Tom, and Rob. Do I have a motion to either accept or amend and accept the minutes for December 17th? So moved. Motion by Rob. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kate. All those eligible to vote on the December 17th minutes uh, to approve, please raise your right hand. We have approval of the December 17th minutes, and we can move on to our first order of business. Uh, first of actual action item for the evening, which is 367 River Street, if the applicants wish to come forward uh, to the table. <coughs> and if you'll both state your name for the record, I'll then put you under oath and I'm going to have Meredith do an overview of where we stand, given that this is an amendment and give the board some background. Uh, Fred Connor, Connor Contracting. And my brother John is uh, joining me as well. And uh, Jeff Oleski from Willis Consulting Engineers, the civil engineer for the project. Okay. Uh, if uh, those of you who do intend to testify, and John, if you aren't intending to testify, it's probably best to put you all under oath at this point in time. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Do. Okay. You're all under oath. Uh, are there any people in the audience tonight that wish to be <coughs> on this particular application? Okay. Seeing none, um, we will go forward with this application. And Meredith, if you'll give us an overview, update, and background. Okay. So this is a application for a site amendment for a um, active open permit. Um, that's for redevelopment of the old John Deere site on River Street. Um, and that um, building, that development has been active on, so it's in process. But um, the applicants, Connor Brothers, are looking to add a new use because um, they have a new tenant um, to take over part of the space um, and then make some site plan changes. Some of those are related to the new use. 
some of them are just things that got tweaked as they worked on the site plan and coordinated with the Department of Public Works about things like stormwater drainage um, and what was actually available there at the site. Um, there's a couple of big issues that need to be dealt with. Um, one is that um, applicant has requested to have the change of use be evaluated under the 2011 regulations along with all of the site plan amendment uh, requests. Um, my analysis was that some of those site plan amendments could be made under the 2011 regulations, but that the change of use and potentially those site plan changes like the loading area that are linked to that change of use can be evaluated from the 2018 amendment uh, regulations. So it's <coughs> all, both sets are laid out in here, both analyses, but that's a, a starter issue that you're going to have to, starter determination you're going to have to look at. Um, the other th big thing to note is that in here there were some open questions about traffic analysis. Um, and since the staff report was distributed, we got that traffic analysis uh, review from RSG as well as Department of Public Works comments on that. I'm going to pass those out to you right now. Um, and what I think are probably the big picture comments from Tom McCardle have been highlighted in yellow, but please review his full overview. Um, the, the big item that came up in that traffic analysis was whether or not there needed to be a left turn lane. Um, and after RSG's full review of um, the, the underlying data that's available, and then Tom's review of that, Tom's conclusion was that Tom McArdle's conclusion was that we did not need that left turn lane, um, but that it was something to look at in the future on Route 302 development. Um, that the the um, applicant had raised that Tractor Supply did not have a left turn lane, which through you know Tom says, well, maybe there was more traffic there than they actually thought there was going to be. So, but for this project, they didn't think that they needed a left turn lane based on the numbers. So, and that's Tom's conclusion as of today. Tom's conclusion as of this evening, looking at RSG's analysis, which is also included in that packet. I'm going to put two copies of this information on the table over there. Okay. Have you seen this yep. and they have final conclusion? Yes, we have. Thank you. new information addresses a lot of the red that you see in the staff report. Um, some of the other outstanding questions and determinations that you'll want to make are, some of the big ones are the pedestrian issue with removing the um, walkway to the rear of the building. There's a landscaping question that I don't have the discretion to make. Um, and I think that the applicants um, have actually addressed the question I raised about capping a severed water connection in their letter, which is in the new information you were given as well. They're point two. Um, so that was a question I had raised on page nine <coughs> of the staff report. Um, so that's been dealt with. Up, we'll, you can work through it and then we'll, I've got my marked up version of the staff report so I'll make sure we don't miss anything. I think, uh, okay, thanks. Is yep, that, that's, I think that's all I've got right now. I think it would be helpful, maybe if Predator Jeff, if you want to give us an overview as to what specific changes you're making from the existing permit that you have. I think that's a helpful framework because our decision is is really ba based on what those changes are from your existing permit. Obviously, if there's things from the old permit that's not under review at this time. Uh, and so let's let's look at the things that are triggering these threshold yeah. issues. I'm happy to do that. Um, in conferring with the applicant, uh, we were helping our plan of attack. He was hoping to uh, essentially provide a little more background information to that the reason behind this as a whole and then turn it over to me to specifically line item, go through the, the proposed changes. 
Um, so if it, it's okay with the board, that's, I think Fred that's certainly fine. Okay. Um, through the chair, I'd just like to ask if the board can have a, uh, a couple minutes to read my letter of yesterday um, that you, that you um, just received. Um, this and is separately, I just wanted to introduce the company. Uh, the uh, San El Napa Company is a fourth generation family owned company based in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, they've had this store in Montpelier for uh, over 10 years. Uh, they operate on a hub and spoke system, so Burlington is the hub. This is one of their seven stores in Vermont that uh, is a spoke. Uh, they have a zero to two deliveries a day uh, f f uh, with their own company box trucks uh, from Burlington. And they have uh, half a dozen employees and hoping that they do uh, better at this location to be able to uh, grow somewhat, both the store and uh, employees. So that, that's just a brief overview. Where, where are they currently located? Pardon? Where are they currently located? They're currently located at uh, 373 River Street, which is uh, up the, it's uh, south of about uh, 1,000 feet. Oh, okay. So it's, it's in the general same neighborhood. They're just moving to a higher profile location, which Pardon? would be your property. They're moving to a higher profile location, which is your property. And, and a slightly larger space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm happy to have us take a look at this memo. It's Thank you. Fairly short. This is the two page letter from January 21st, correct? Yes. So, Fred, if I can just sort of summarize this, I understand this letter, make sure I under Pardon? No problem. If I can summarize this letter and understand the import of it, just so we have a record, um, as opposed to us reading the document, you're pointing out that part of what's driving this is you've gone from a spec building to one that's actually going to be occupied by a, an actual tenant with whom you've contracted through a lease. Yes. Uh, the second is that, um, you know, your traffic study is well below the threshold that our current zoning regulations require that's a traffic right. study and a specific turn lane uh, within 3024. Is that is that accurate? Yes, and that's been confirmed with... Uh, Right as, I under, right, as I understand, that was the import of McArdle's letter in response to your, your letter. Yes. Um, was there anything else that you wished us to, to take away from this letter? Uh, no, just that uh, in my tenure in working in this business, um, I have usually experienced a capital P permitted use as being a, a zoning administrative decision. So, you know, we're um, almost at the point of paying rent for all the time we spend with Meredith. Um, <laughs> In going th in living on the top of the fence between the old regs and the new regs, so right? That's it's just it's been a challenge. I mean, if, for this issue to take 23 pages for a staff report, I mean, it's just a lot of work for Meredith, and uh, we hope we don't have any other, <laughs> other uh, remaining business uh, before you uh, until the, we jump into the new the new right. regs. <laughs> I, well, I mean, and part of this is <coughs> the fact that we went from zoning bylaws that had been largely unchanged with a few minor amendments for you know 10 plus years to radically new zoning bylaws that have added a lot of detail and process to our review 
um, as well as you know a new new staff that are getting used to how we implement those bylaws. So you know to the extent that this has caused some struggle, part of that's just borne out by the fact of when you get new bylaws like this and, and the level of detail and scrutiny that they require, a lot of trees are fallen. <laughs> I appreciate your comments, and we are working through it. So. so I don't think it's reflective of necessarily the applicant, or it's just the challenges that are poised, posed by the timing in the new bylaws. I agree. So, um, okay. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted yes. to no. present as background? Good. Thanks. So, Jeff? So, yeah, I'll, uh, I guess I'd start in by uh, referring again the, the board to our letter submitted on the applicant's behalf dated December 26th of 2018 that attempted to highlight the physical changes associated with the site plan amendments that we're requesting, um, specifically driven by this uh, additional change in use related to uh, uh, going from a spec building really to a, a specific tenant that, um, again, is not a plan to represent the entire use of the building, which I think is, should be clear. Um, the Proposed building size uh, of 10,000 square feet has remained unchanged. The lower locations remained unchanged. Um, but this specific use will be 6,000 square feet of that, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, is more or less the uh, northern two thirds of the building. That's or six, six tenths of the building, I guess I should say. Um, and so that's a change in use component. Um, that the auto parts uh, store didn't really fall under any of the previously permitted or, or approved uses and so some of that's the driving force behind this uh, change in use which I think gets to the uh, heart of whether we're reviewed under the 2011 regulations or 2018 regulations and I, I'm not sure I guess it's I'll be at the board's discretion tonight as to whether it's re projects reviewed under those the old or the new regs or some combination of both but uh, again I just want to I'll, I'll highlight just the physical uh, changes and feel free to stop me if there's any questions on anything specific um, but this letter references one through eight, and uh, the proposed site plan, uh, we included in the application both the new plans, the previously approved plans, as well as two sheets that are essentially marked up with revision clouds, uh, re revision clouds, and then numerically uh, kind of try to call out these eight revisions. So if you want to follow along with me, um, the first obvious is just this uh, request to change in use, or additional use, I should say, of adding the retail sales and service as we feel it best fits the, the new use. Um, as pointed out in the staff uh, report, it was a permitted use both under the old regulations and the new regulations, and we've, we've highlighted that on the plans. Um, item two was under the old plans, uh, there was similar to the front walkway, there was a five foot uh, concrete sidewalk, pedestrian access along the back, um, and that has since been removed and the parking space is sh shifted two feet closer to the building to free up another two feet of aisle width in the back. And then we've uh, kind of changed the configuration here. We still do have two concrete pads at the man doors where they'll be located, and then a kind of a bigger dedicated loading area, understanding that uh, the proposed tenant will need that space to be uh, periodically loading up and unloading uh, parts. Um, but I think uh, another component of this is that now under the new proposal, the back parking area is really going to function more for really just the loading and employee parking. It isn't really intended to be customer based. Um, so given the amount of parking that we're proposing uh, versus what we should necessarily be required under zoning rigs, we're over, um, and that's another one, uh, number three actually, I guess I'm combining two and three. Um, we're certainly proposing more parking spaces than it would be required for this use. So we feel that we can kind of dedicate the back parking uh, to this either employees and or loading. Um, so part of that reconfiguration um, to accommodate this larger, larger loading area was a removal of three parking spaces as noted in number three. So we've gone from 58 total to 55 with the three just being removed in the back here. Um, number four was Again, kind of minor, but the exterior lights on the back of the building were realigned to go over the overhead, uh, over the doors, the man doors, obviously, just from a safety standpoint. Um, number five was uh, this northeast corner here. Uh, the previous plans 
kind of had the paving and curbing limits kind of very close to the edge of the property line and there was a little more pavement right at this corner and in, in kind of going through the construction pro uh, process and talking to the neighbor to the north um, the old plans there's an existing kind of dilapidated old concrete retaining wall it's only like two feet tall but it's right along the property line here um, and there was some interest in removing that wall and just kind of grading that out and this kind of little sliver of pavement really wasn't providing any benefit to the parking or the access to the property and we felt we could pull that in a couple feet and would allow us to naturally just grade this slope down on like a two or three on one slope and be able to eliminate that wall which the neighbor preferred because they wouldn't be backing into it with the cars and there'd be a little more room for snow storage there um, so we kind of made that construction decision to kind of pull that in a little bit to allow for um, you know, again, at the neighbor's request, and we didn't see any harm in it. So um, along those lines, though, I, I think, as, as mentioned in the staff report, is we, when we pulled that, that pavement in, it did narrow up this little throat here, uh, the traffic pattern being a one-way in a counterclockwise fashion um, proposed for the site. Uh, the, the main uh, throughway width here is 24 feet for a one-way road, which is obviously pretty substantial. Um, at its narrowest before, it was about 23, a little over 23 feet now, and I believe we're a little over 21 now. Um, so we've, we've narrowed that down a little bit, but based on the uh, information we've been provided by the tenant as far as the size of their trucks, you know, understanding there won't be any tractor trailers, it'll all just be box vans at, at the largest, um, and also understanding that this is a one-way traffic pattern, we have no uh, reservations about this, this revised parking area being able to accommodate uh, vehicles or creating any type of uh, unsafe conditions for users. Um, moving on to number six, again, kind of a minor one, but the underground uh, liquid propane tank, uh, we just shifted this to the south a little bit um, to get it further away from the through lanes uh, just to provide it a little more safety. And by doing that, uh, previously we had guardrail called for this corner to protect it but we were able to eliminate that guardrail because we have enough clearance and separation now and we've just replaced it with a couple bollards. Um, number seven would be the drainage reconfiguration. Uh, as part of the original approval, uh, there was always some kind of uncertainty about the condition of the existing drainage features uh, within 302 on the west side of, of 302 here. And, and we were originally, there's some drainage, underground drainage around the back that we were tying into a, one specific structure. And then we had some drainage up front that we were tying into another structure. Long story short is in, in excavating and review of these structures with the Department of Public Works, we agreed that there was one structure that was in better condition to tie into. So we've just combined our drainage in the back and the front to a catch basin in the front and regraded accordingly so that we can tie into that structure now. Um, that was all under done with the supervision of the Department of Public Works and I believe Tom did provide a more or less a sign off on that. Um, and then the last, uh, number eight, is just a relocation of the water service alignment. Uh, previously we're coming in, at, tying in about the same location but just based on the tenant, the tenant fit ups and the building requirements there was a desire to have the exterior water service enter on a different corner of the building, so we've just reconfigured that on, on property. Um, so I think that's a summary of the physical changes. Um, obviously nothing major here, but cumulatively, you know, they add up, and, and uh, that coupled with the, the additional use, I think certainly it, uh, was the reason behind the, the meeting with the board here tonight. So um, I think that's, again, a, if there's any questions on any of those physical summaries, I, I guess the next step would be able to go through the staff notes and address those kind of in a sure. sequential fashion, if that makes sense. I think it does. Well, well, one question that I have initially is uh, when, when we had this application before us uh, previously, one of the concerns I remember, of course, was the traffic slow uh, <coughs> behind the back of the building. And Jeff, if I understand your representations now, is that traffic flow behind the build would going behind the building would largely be either employee or these supply trucks that would be coming around the back to unload supplies to the loading dock behind. Is the customer then going to be directed to essentially take a hard left and park in front of the building in that area? Yeah, I think that the really only entrances to both of the tenant spaces will be on the front, front of the building, the front doors. 
So uh, whether by signage or just common knowledge, you know, the, the intent is for all customer vehicles to do park in the uh, what amounts to 18 and 18, 36 parking spaces, uh, double loaded parking spaces in the front. Okay. Um, so all the pedestrian traffic would be coming from the front of the building. And and so if there was a condition that that you know required signage to that effect, uh, such as you know, stating that the portion, the, the driveway around the back of the of the building is for employees or loading only. Um, would that cause a problem, or would that be acceptable? I, uh, I'd like to think about what it would say, but um, I, and I'm not trying to suggest wording, but give a general impact or effect of what I'm. I see it as a condition or with signage. It, just a condition that there would be some signage that would direct the flow of traffic around to the front because this starts to get into the issue of pedestrian traffic in, in these changes. Uh, that would not be a problem. Employee parking or employee slash uh, shipping receiving. Okay. In part because that, that leads me to the next question, which is if this rear parking then is for employees and or loading and unloading, would they be entering the building from the back? Yes. Okay. There's so two, there's, there's a man door and an over. You, you mentioned loading dock just as a minor correction. It's it's a, they're both overhead uh, at grade overhead doors. So for each tenant, there's a man door and an over and a uh, an overhead door. Okay. And, and they would be coming in from the back. That, that I appreciate that correction, and I think that's helpful, um, because. <coughs> it, that leads me to the question as far as one of our concerns at least is on the pedestrian flow that you're pro proposing to change around the back and I'm understanding from your testimony that no pedestrian at least as you're envisioning it would be coming from the back around the building to the front that no. if somebody's parking back there they're an employee and or delivery uh, truck and would be utilizing the doors in back correct okay and, and we have this uh, new signage on the right side of the building as you're looking in from the road. We also are going to have the other left side, which is do not enter. Correct. So. And, and that, that, was that was one of the requirements, if I remember correctly, from your last yep. go-round. So, yep. so this would just be changing the signage on the uh, north side to, yes. to employee and or loading only or whatever configuration. Mr. Chair, I might, might suggest and would ultimately leave this to you. But um, a, a more straightforward way to do the signage might be to say customer parking to yep. the left so that people aren't stopping and scratching their heads about employee and loading. Yep. They know that they're customers. Yep. Um, and the or, or customer parking, uh, employee parking only. Sure, or even just the, the employees will know what to do because they work there. It's the folks who may be coming for the first time who need the direction. So you may want to focus your signage on the people who need the direction, the customers. But so the, uh, ultimately, you, you up to you. Just an customer idea. Customer parking with an arrow to the left instead. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'd be fine with you. Either really, one. up to you, but that might be more yeah. straightforward. Yeah, I think that right. makes a lot of sense. Both those suggestions perfectly amenable to where I'm coming from. Any other sort of overall questions as to some of these changes? If not, um, <coughs> we'll accept Jeff's invitation to have us dive into the staff report. Uh, and I think there's a threshold question here, see if I can tee that up, about 2011. Yeah, I mean, it's really how much of this is reviewable under the 2011 regulations. Generally, if they were coming to me with just the site plan amendment, I would have just put the, the, the whole, and originally this is what we were discussing, was that all of these site plan changes could have just been reviewed by me under the 2011 regulations, and then we do the change of use into it. The change of use generally would be something that would be reviewed under the 2018 regulations, but they wanted it reviewed under the 2011 regulations, which I didn't agree I was able to do. Plus, once you review change of use under the 2018 regulations, it triggers a fresh site plan for that change of use, which means you have to take a look at the landscaping which, as we all know, our current landscaping regulations are troublesome, um, and we're working to change those, but I can't do
do exceptions or do anything right. like that. It's a, it's so it's that's why it came to you um, because it is it is a permitted use. So okay. if we didn't have to deal with those landscaping regulations, even under the 2018 regulations, I would have been able to do that administratively. We just we we came we, we ended up with a odd little conundrum on this one. If I can ask a few points of clarification, um, my understanding is that when this permit originally came, and obviously this predates you, yes. um, but my recollection was that we reviewed it largely as a potential medical office, in part because that was the heaviest potential permitted use. Correct. That's my understanding that that was the big question. That's how you dealt with traffic um, and number of parking spaces. And, issues, and really what, what this represents, if, if I also understand some of the filings that, that the applicant has made, is that now you are seeking this change of use based on an actual applicant and that this change of use represents a sort of roll, rollback of some of the uh, needed numbers as far as traffic uh, and use is concerned. Yes, and it, if I can just clarify, we are asking for this other use for the entire building because obviously retail sales and service would probably lead to the other piece being retail sales and service, but we'd like to preserve the other uses that we already have approved mm -hmm. in the event that we found a compatible user. <clears throat> right. I just want to clarify because I think it's more troublesome for me at least if you're going from a less onerous use to a more rigorous use um, that might trigger some of the uh, site plan amendments and, and the need to review them because you're essentially going from something that may not have received the same level of scrutiny that it deserves. But here we have really the inverse, which is we have a spec building that now has an actual tenant, which is driving the request for, for modification. And so the question is, are we, are we really changing this um, in the same sense that I think the modification bylaws envision, which is when you have this type of, of lesser use and, and you then want to swap out uses. Um, I'll, just, I'll just throw that out there as, as, as sort of where my thinking begins. So I, I think that makes sense to me as well if the original consideration, which I was not part of, mm -hmm. um, was for a more intensive use. And sometimes it's, it's a and, and I'm sorry. Um, is that the case that the original use approved, I think, was medical? That, that was right? that was one of the three one original the uses three. approved, okay. was it medical clinic, which, which is less in traf more traffic than what we are currently is contemplating. I'm, I'm sorry. Is, yes. It is more traffic. Hold on, I want to look at the most recent item just because we got the updated numbers from RSG. Thank you. I'm a little... There were three. There were three potential uses that were approved. Mm -hmm. Medical use being one of those. The other two uh, being business office office space. <coughs> My recollection at the time when we approved it was that we were giving it a pretty broad brush type of approval. You were doing it. Right. It was written up as such. Right. That was, that was my that was my understanding, and, and in part because the applicant did not have a specific tenant, but wanted to carve out room so that the sort of heaviest allowable or likely use would be covered. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that was consistent both with other members, but but also laying down. And, and I think it's clear, at least where I'm coming from, that that think as a predicate to our question here, we're looking at this specific amendment in those in those lenses as opposed to either a fresh amendment or something that was um, increasing the use. Yep. I I see that. I guess I'm just as a on an administrative level my only concern is future if somebody's just coming for a change of use mm -hmm. to an open permit 
if, if there's a change of use going on, generally that would be a new permit. It's our, our evaluation criteria for whether or not for for which for, bylaws, for which, which bylaws right, right, for which under, bylaws do not take under. into account the intensity of the use being requested right. when deciding which Th bylaws. Thank to you be for <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Yeah, and so that's why I'm I'm <coughs> wondering if if that if discussing the like you said the intensity of the use when we're trying to figure out which regulations apply mm -hmm. comes can into we, play here. Can we determine to evaluate it under the 2011 rules? Well, this is what well, I, think I didn't think I could do that. And so this is why I'm just trying to this is why I'm yeah. just throwing that out there. Is well, that a proper place to? Because well, this also comes into play when I'm doing this. Sure, and and, and I to a, to a certain extent I, I I would say that some of this is the is us feeling through these relatively mm -hmm. new regulations yeah. and trying to interpret them. So when I look at, for example, the section 4205 that talks about amending a zoning permit or site plan, mm -hmm. and it says that allows the administrative officer to amend an open zoning permit or site plan without a new application or development review board if the proposed change, and, and part of this is I think what you're seeking clarification, is not a material change. Mm -hmm. uh, and does not affect the type of character or intensity of the approved development or use to the extent it's specified below. Um, and then it gives those various subcategories. I believe that under under section two, we need that's where I'm going with some of the analysis, is that what we're talking about is a scaling back as opposed to an increase in the intensity. Okay. And so then, you know, you, you've cited as well 4205A that talks about a material change means a change in the development of land or structure may have affected the decision made or any conditions placed on the permit if it had been included in the plans as approved. So in a case like this, I think it's also relevant too that part of the history here is that um, we, it, it wouldn't have um, made a difference except for that we probably would have had less conditions. So it's, it's not a material, I think it's, it, it makes a material change a very fact-specific mm -hmm. determination, um, which doesn't make your job any easier as a subject administrator <laughs> going forward, because in some ways it has to be up to us as a DRB to deter make that determination. And, and so in that case, where you can't make a clear determination, um, it's certainly, I think, legitimate to kick it up to us. But then I would say that as the sort of quasi-adjudicated body sitting in review of this, it is our purview and, and ability to take this and look and say, is this really a material change based on our collective uh, and institutional knowledge of the prior permit? Perfect. Thank you. So I'm really comfortable with that analysis. Uh, <laughs> and, and I've seen and I've seen other boards operate in a right. similar way. Um, and and I do also appreciate that this, uh, you know, in terms of exercising your discussion, is appropriate. When it's not, um, when it's not crystal clear. And I'll try not to do it too often for you, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> We're hopefully also ending the, a point where we don't have two yeah. sets of regulations yeah. in play soon. So, if, if, <laughs> I got one more coming your way, Mary. So. I, oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Different if, builder, but yes. <laughs> if Fred didn't have something to complain about, you know, but <laughs> just. But I think it's a consideration that. Change of use is very compatible with the area. It's not. That, you know, I think that I can see this to it's a situation where the change in use, yes, it may be lesser because of less traffic, but uh, it may have a greater impact to you know the surrounding surrounding area. And that's not the case here, which I feel we I would agree. Yeah. How does the rest of the board feel? Is anyone wishing to express a consensus? I mean, I feel like we're we're generating consensus towards the 2011. Reviewing this under a 2011 bylaws, unless no, it, only, it only makes sense. I mean, you, you know, we've been through this in a mm -hmm. detailed analysis type of, type of way here. And, uh, it's it's well documented. Sure. And I, I agree too. Given your analysis, Dan, as well as the, the facts presented in this specific case, I think that, that it makes sense. Okay. Good. Okay. So, with that consensus, then I think we really have to. You, um, page 
you pick a chapter book, you, you know, you make a decision, you go to a different She's chapter. Right so, there you go. That's yeah. Well, I'll, I'll simply, before we get to that, though, I think we do have to review some of the yeah. uh, other threshold issues. Um, and that's, um, that starts with, I think, number five, and, no, six, sorry, under the site plan criteria. Now, I'm skipping over. Uh, in the staff report number five, the dimensional requirements, because as you've testified, nothing's really changing um, with with this uh, lot area, lot frontage, lot coverage, building height. So really, it's a question of uh, the impact on the streets under section 702. And we've now received testimony both from you as well as from Tom McCardle that uh, the impact to streets uh, does not reach any type of threshold where we're required to put it on conditions or actions, specifically a left turn lane in 302. Is that fair to with the board? Um, then the next one is, is 703, which talks about pedestrian access and circulation uh, and whether the board is satisfied with the level of pedestrian safety at the rear of the building when the concrete walkway is replaced with a three foot wide strip stone drip edge and granite curbing um, as opposed to the sidewalk that you had originally proposed along that back and I understand from your testimony that uh, this is really going to be uh, a limited access parking lot um, it's going to largely be employees which you know we've previously found are going to have a greater familiarity with the with the traffic circulation as well as the um, access points as opposed to customers who may or may not have that same level of familiarity uh, and who will be parking in the front where there are no changes proposed. Uh, is there any other questions from the board as far as a pedestrian circulation or any concerns? Um, and then um, there is the, the 705 and 707 about the parking that you're going from 58 to 55, you're removing three spaces. Um, however, they're still in conformance with the zoning bylaws. Um, and then uh, uh, under the performance standards of 714, um, talks about these regulations require that no use shall emit offensive no noise, odor, dust, smoke, noxious gases, reflect light, or cause a fire, explosion, or safety hazard, or create electrical interference. Um, this is going to be a retail auto, auto parts store. Correct. And uh, will there be any automotive servicing going on, no. or is this, this is simply sale of retail parts? Um, and is it anticipated that any of these will create the type of noise, odor, dust, noxious gases, no. uh, light reflections? And, and this is going to be similar to the existing auto parts store that is currently about a thousand feet away, um, right. as well as other auto parts stores in, in the area. <coughs> There is the water supply and sewage disposal, and these were your points uh, eight, I think, and seven. And so, just so I understand, the, the water service to the shed in back is no longer going back there. Yeah, that was. I apologize. We didn't specifically address that. I, I think um, Fred had included that in one of his notes as far as a comment, but there was a. a Understanding that when this project first started, there were two separate parcels here. There was a, a, a building associated with this portion of Blue Lake Terrace. There was a water service that was connected there. And uh, as part of the construction process, we, we took that service back to the main cut and capped it per Department of Public Works you know, requirements that mm -hmm. that's been addressed. So we could certainly um, put a note to that effect on the revised plan if it was deemed necessary. It was a mobile home that. Um the right. city asked us to remove, asked um, Cumberland Farms to remove, which we arranged for them. And as part of doing that job, we cut and capped the water line. Uh, 
I think it would be accurate just for record keeping purposes to just have that noted in any final plan. Um, Glad to. sales and service uh, as a conditional use. Uh, no, no we it's, don't. Just, it's, a per, it's a permitted use. Right, no, that's what I thought. Okay. It's a permitted use, it's not conditional. Okay. It's just that there's, you're, you, go ahead, sorry. Normally I would have dealt with it okay. administratively, but because there were questions on how to go forward right. and I disagreed with the applicant on how to go forward, the whole thing came to you, so you get to look at the change of use as Did I do the conditional use criteria for some reason? I'm sorry. That's why I'm <laughs> looking at some confusion. I did more work than I had to. My apologies. Um, but I don't think I did that for the 2018, did I? No, I just did a site plan for 2018. Right. Yeah, I think so then you're pretty much done. Yep. That was just. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, still nice to understand. Um, with that, then, I, um, as I'm understanding, and, and part, it's a, let me ask first does anyone on the board have any other questions about any of the other issues that we have? Hearing none, oh, go ahead, Rob. Um, I just have one question about um, rep use uh, on the back. I guess that uh, you have general refuse, but it's on part store, everything uh, like uh, motor oil and all that stuff, that's like enclosed inside the, the, the building, or maybe that service will be provided here. We have a um, loading, uh, an enclosed um, trash area where uh, Jeff was pointing it out. Um, but we don't expect that to be like a service station, automotive trash being generated, it's taking it back to your uh, home or shop. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Good. Um, let me just suggest that the two conditions that I'm aware of so far are we want to have the applicant develop signage that will either affirmatively direct customers to the left or, and or um, notify them that travel along the north side of the building is restricted to. I think Kate's suggestion is probably the better <coughs> way to do it because the employees are going to know where to go. Right. right. The customers need, need the arrow. After they get there, go there once, they'll, they'll know the program. But. And, and I'm simply suggesting you could, we could make a conditions for both so that you would still have the choice if you go to your signage people or traffic okay. people and they say, no, 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 you'll always want to state it this way. Okay, I appreciate the flexibility. Uh, because I think either one gets the, the mes message across. Um, yeah. One may be more effective. And I, I do tend to think that Kate's suggestion is on point. Um, and then the second being uh, to amend the site plan to show the cap water line for three Moonlight Terrace. Are there any other conditions that we're seeking? Uh, just point of clarification. Stop. From the previous decision, where we wanted to keep all those conditions still in place as well. What I understood. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you landscaping and lighting signage <laughs> all right. over this. Uh, other than as modified by the okay. the, 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 the this amendment. Yeah, and I think it's a, I think it's important, Tom. I think you're on. I think you're on track on point with that. That uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are treating this as though it's a, just an amendment. To line with that, you still want to keep the condition about this not changing the expiration date of the fire permit? Right. Do you, let me ask the applicant that this is an 
Could you repeat the question, this is, please? Sorry. This is this application is, I think, timed to expire this summer, uh, which would be the like June, June around 10th. Yeah. June tenth, two thousand nineteen. John's the project manager, and he's, <laughs> he's delivering occupancy by May 15. <laughs> I, I don't see it as being an issue. Okay. As far as having all site conditions done, did you say paving, landscaping, etc.? Correct. Yeah, we can, we can meet that. Okay. Uh, I mean, otherwise, I'm not trying to set you up for failure. Assuming spring comes. <laughs> <laughs> Always an iffy proposition at this time of year. Um, okay. Well, obviously, if, if worse comes to worse, you can always come back and seek uh, an amendment. Are they no. eligible? Uh, they can't get another one-year extension. They already got right. it on this okay. one. Oh, that's right. They have the one-year extension already. Right. So um, this would be where they would need to get any sort of extension on that. But it also it doesn't need to be 100% complete. Right. Substantially. Substantially, we'll, we'll which is like 75%. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll look at it. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure that was addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so with those three conditions, I'll either entertain a motion or um, discussion about further conditions. Anybody want to make affirmative so, motion? I was so moved as you have outlined. <laughs> um, and either what though? No, it doesn't matter because it's 6,000 square feet. Sorry. The, the reason the conditional use. Right, was in there 10, is because it was for 10,000 square feet. Okay. <laughs> now that makes more sense. Yes, now I'm like, wait, okay. I know I didn't do that for no reason whatsoever. Okay, so motion motion by Tom. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Deb. Any further discussion? Could we just, or nothing else for my edification, could we just restate exactly what the motion is? Sure. But as I understand the motion, it is to a, approve the permit amendment as applied for with the following three conditions. One is that the applicant shall develop and implement signage um, either either or either affirmatively directing customers to the front of the building or notifying entrance that the north entrance is employee delivery only or both um, to amend the site plan to show the capped water line at three Moonlight Terrace and three uh, to retain the existing deadline for substantial completion. And all other conditions of the underlying and permit. And all other conditions of the underlying permit remaining the same. That's fine. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the amendment as stated in the motion, please raise your right hand have your permit amendment. Very good. Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. Very you. Much. I just have to point out too, I sincerely appreciate Meredith and Tom's timely review of, uh, of the material. It's uh, certainly appreciated to get that addressed tonight. So thank you, Meredith. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, Meredith. Sorry, I was just like, wait. I can't wait <laughs> to do that conditional use <laughs> review for absolutely no reason. Well. <laughs> Nothing is ever futile. Um, okay, so the next item of business on our agenda is the uh, application for Vermont College of Fine Arts. Uh, at this point, I'm going to recuse myself and step down uh, and we'll allow the applicant to come forward and Kate will take over. Good luck. Thank you, Dan. Welcome everybody. Um, this is an application for minor site plan and conditional use review of, for the Vermont College of Fine Arts, 36 College Street. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, just for the benefit of every, everyone here, um, say what site plan review and conditional use review are, um, and then I'll just outline how we'll proceed from there so that everybody knows when they will get to say their piece. 
So um, with that, uh, site plan review is a type of review that looks at a project's configuration and its purpose in order to understand impacts on factors including access and circulation for people biking, walking, or driving, landscaping and screening, lighting, and design. This review evaluates the project against site plan standards, and for those following along at home, site plan review is section 320 of our 2018 zoning regulations. So then conditional use review is a type of review for uses that may be suitable in a given location with appropriate conditions. It has standards to evaluate the impact of a project on community facilities and utilities, traffic, and character of the neighborhood, and that is section 330 of our 2018 zoning regulations. Um, so what I'm going to do is swear in witnesses and others who may wish to testify on this. Um, then we'll get an overview of the project from Meredith. We'll hear from the applicant about the application, um, from anyone in support of the project. Uh, we'll ask questions, and we'll hear from anyone else who might like to speak on the project. The board tends to ask questions as we go, um, and toward the end we will walk through the staff report, focusing especially on any question marks that remain. Uh, very good. So with that, um, I will swear in the witnesses. So anyone wishing to testify on this application, please raise their right hands. Anyone, if just listening? If, if you'd like to come to the microphone later, would have you sworn in now. Um, would have, okay, very good. So. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you're about to give for the matter under consideration is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Okay. Um, very good. So anyone else who's here, I'd just also remind you to sign in if you haven't already. Okay. So with that, I'll turn to Meredith for an overview of the application and key issues. Um, so the main reason this is coming to you is because it's a conditional use. Um, surface parking is a conditional use. Um, but it is also sort of a outside of the box application and that we do not have a general provision in our current regulations for a temporary use other than construction purposes um, but uh, Vermont College of Fine Arts is looking to use the old tennis courts for temporary parking um, for Agency of Transportation who is looking for a, a interim location for a number of its employees um, as it got bumped out of the National Life Building with the fire and the water damage up there and they're looking for a permanent solution but they're not quite there yet um, so this is not you know they're not looking to convert the tennis courts at this time to permanent parking in light of that um, because we do have a general definition for temporary use in our regulations, which says that everything has to be able to revert back so you couldn't even tell the use was there. Um, the Vermont College of Fine Arts is asking to be able to use this for, temp for parking, again, temporarily, which means that they're asking to not have to do new fencing or new landscaping because inherently those things, if they're put in properly, wouldn't be temporary, wouldn't really be able to extract them um, very well and, and have the use not be viewable. Um, you know, keep, one reason we're seeing this as a standalone application is because in the permit history, there is a master plan under the old regulations for an academic institution, PUD. Um, there's, there's a whole pro permit process for that, but that has expired so they can't apply for just an amendment under there. There also was a full permit to convert these tennis courts to parking permanently, but that expired, so they can't make use of that either. Do you know what year that was? Uh, it's in here, I want to say it was 2013, 2014. Okay, it wasn't, because I read like that. It, yeah. it was a while ago, but it wasn't. It wasn't ages it was ago. ago. Right, it wasn't okay. eons ago. 2013, 2014, they applied to amend their old uh, AIPUD master plan. AIPUD. Yep, it was under that to get, among other things, um, a permit to convert the tennis courts to parking. Now, that permit has been used up. They made some of the changes. They converted the tennis court area. They paved it over, but they didn't complete 
the application. They didn't put up the required screening, screening. the fencing, so um, or anything. Or right. So that permit expired, and they can't make use of it anymore. Um, and they're not 100% sure that they're actually going to include that in the next master plan. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is a little preview of something we're going to be discussing in the future. But right now, what we're looking at is a request for a temporary use, which is why they haven't necessarily requested to do all the changes that we would normally do if it were a permanent use. And it's a, it's sort of a, like I said, it's outside of the box, um, but it wasn't something where I felt it made sense for me to deny it and then have it be brought here anyway under mm -hmm. appeal. <clears throat> and then it made sense to bring it here and let you take a look at it. So we are, we are starting from scratch with this, for those who may remember the, the previous discussions. Mm -hmm. Great, so I'll just have you introduce yourself and then give us an overview of what, what you're requesting and what you'd like to make sure the board knows about. Sure, um, so I'm Katie Gustafson. I work at Vermont College of Fine Arts. I've actually worked there for about 20 years, um, several different jobs, um, and currently I'm the vice president for campus planning. Um, and I've been in this role for about two years, give or take. Um, and so one of the things I've been doing since I started in this role is really trying to fill up our excess space. Um, we only have about uh, 400 students, give or take. I think we're a little below that right now. Um, all but one program are low residency, so they're not all on campus at one time. So given that we have uh, 12 buildings, um, they often are empty unless we have students on campus. So. Um, it's really been part of our business plan right from the get-go that we would have other tenants on our campus. Um, when we originally started out, uh, Union Institute and University was there, uh, Community College of Vermont was there, um, which were large institutional tenants that took up two um, of our large buildings. Um, and since they've left, we've tried very hard to have the state come in. And they, they are there now in their CAPS, um, capacity, which is a training program that they run for all state employees. It's a, it's a really nice fit with uh, the mission of the college. Um, and we have entertained all kinds of different possibilities over the last few years, none of which have come to fruition. Um, but right now, I've basically said I'd love to do whatever I can to, to get a tenant there. And what they need right now is a temporary location. That's not ideally what I would have come to campus. I'd love somebody to permanently move in, or at least a long-term lease. Um, but because of the fire at National Life, in addition to some other um, projects that they're hoping to accomplish, the state is considering using our location as a swing space as they attempt to eventually find a permanent location uh, for the Agency of Transportation um, and then potentially use it for other groups as they do other construction projects. So um, in talking with them, one of their biggest concerns is parking. Um, again, because our programs come and go and they're not there all the time, there are some times when it's fairly easy to find a parking place up at the college and then there are other times when it's much more challenging. And for them to uh, feel like this is a really good location for their AOT folks, um, parking was something that uh, they wanted us, the college, to um, work on a significant plan to be able to accommodate their needs. And so in sort of thinking about this, um, I, I thought maybe we could just talk about it in a temporary, um, because the leases are going to be temporary, um, because this is something that the college has contemplated doing, um, turning the tennis courts into permanent parking, I actually thought it was an interesting way to try it out because even though I would like to see it be parking, um, that's not everybody at the college does not agree with my uh, position on that and this would allow us a period of time to use it that way um, to determine if it's, if it's effective, if, if it works well for the neighborhood, if it works well for the college and tenants. So I sort of see it as a, as a way to try something out that doesn't mean that it's going to be that way forever. Great. Um, could you briefly speak to the um, the layout of the parking? I know that we have some some images here, but um, 
Yeah, why I it's mean, I that actually, way. I tried to, in our former master plan, it was, it was slightly um, more complicated than this. And based on um, the space and the requirements I knew I had to meet, this was the most straightforward way to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. um, this leaves, um, and I would have to do some math, which is beyond me at this point, but it leaves more than enough space for basically an entry lane and an exit lane, so there just would be, uh, you know, two-way traffic would be no trouble at all. So mm -hmm. in doing that, um, I was able to carve out 22 spaces mm -hmm. on the um, tennis court surface um, and then reorganize some of uh, what had existed um, in front of the tennis courts into uh, two additional um, handicap parking spaces. Okay, and those are the ones labeled 23 and 24 on the diagram here on Ridge Street. But Correct. Those are um, yep. handicap accessible spaces. Correct. Okay. Uh, very good. Um, are there any questions from board members about about what's been presented? Is there going to be any uh, signage indicating who is allowed to park there? Yes. And all that. Where is that going to be located? Um, I think that we would do it um, in a temporary fashion. Um, certainly open to ideas. I. Uh, drove by the, uh, I think it's 105 State Street, the, with the state lot that is temporary right now, and I saw sort of the metal poles with the placards on it, which indicated reserved parking mm -hmm. places. I imagine doing something like that. And so temporary, I missed it in here, temporary is a year or two years? I think Wonder that the, yeah. based on what Meredith and I have talked about the permit would be valid for two years. Yeah. Uh, at this point, it's very hard to pin the state down. Um, I wish I could tell you that it was, you know, going to be one year or it was going to be six months, but they have not been able to tell me the length. Why, why not develop the parking lot as, as was proposed five years ago? I mean, I would love to do that. It's a it's a matter of um, really whether or not that's a priority for the college, um, and just in terms of our capital funds that we have, that would be a significant investment, I think, to do all the things that um, we would need to do to make it permanent between the fencing, the screening, um, you know, any of the other potential stormwater drainage issues there might have. What, what you're doing without doing that is, is uh, the reasons why we had conditioned it uh, with those screening and, and uh, so forth before was so that it would be compatible with the neighborhood. I'm not sure what you're proposing, just like, just park there as it is, yep. no screening, yep. additional lighting, doesn't sound like a good deal for the neighborhood. Well, I mean, I guess what I would, to speak to that, because I understand that, and I, you know, I'm a resident of Montpelier and I care very deeply about um, our neighborhoods and the people that live here. Um, if it wasn't critical to the success of the college to get a state lease in, I would, uh, you know, and if we had the funding to do all of that right now, I would, you know, happily do that. And um, it is a very challenging time in higher education, and so we are really looking at every avenue that we can to um, keep the college going. Um, of and course. So and, and it is temporary, so well, I... Well, but temporary, one year, two years, you know, can slide considerably. Two years is not really a short period of time. Well, I, I hear you. Uh, just a couple of questions. Yep. Uh, I can imagine during the first snowfall, it's going to have to worry about how to plow and all that. Is, has any consideration been given to that? And second is, when it does snow, how will people know where the designated parking spots are, i.e. that you park in the right spot and don't go over the park, go over the tennis court into the grass or something like that? We actually already plow it. We, we have for years, um, and so so it is cleared. And is it that you could like delineate between the, the tennis court and, and the other surfaces around the tennis court? And we plow right to the edge of the tennis court, so okay. the, the snow banks become sort of a natural barrier, barrier. to to any place else where people might try to, and 
yeah, they wouldn't be able to. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking a little bit about what temporary means, and we're talking a little bit about the needs of a potential future tenant, and also this is a pilot project. Is, it, is that correct? Sure. Okay. So um, I want to highlight something that's in the staff memo. Have you seen the staff memo? I have. Yes. Great. So um, on page nine of that memo, there's, um, there's some suggestion. I want to make sure I understand this. Um, per your cover letter, you've said that the 50 spaces required by this potential tenant can actually be accommodated in existing parking spaces about three quarters of the time. Is that right? Yeah. So when we're talking about using the tennis courts as parking, for all intents and purposes, that's for the 25% of the time when those spaces are otherwise occupied, when the other 50 spaces are taken by other things. Right. I, can you say it yes, one more time? Sorry. Certainly. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Most of the time, if they were to if they were to move in tomorrow yeah. and you didn't convert the tennis courts, yeah. um, you have plenty of parking spaces. But that's true for only seventy five percent of the time. Right, and it's part of that seventy five percent of the time is very predictable because mm -hmm. we have our academic calendar and we know exactly when people are going to be on campus. Other times, it's a little less hard. It's a little harder uh, to determine because CAPS as a training center might have 10 people coming in and upwards to 100 people coming in. So there's just an element of um, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen on any given day. So dedicating a specific area to the state would make it, um, I think, well, I know that it would make it a place they would really consider coming. Our, our ability to provide them with um, dedicated spaces will, in the end, I think, play the biggest role in them deciding to come to the college or not. Okay. So a scenario where the tennis court spaces are only used on an as-needed basis sounds like it would not be what you're seeking. It, it certainly would not be my first choice. That would... Um, create a lot more work and in the end I think potentially the state might say that doesn't work for us. If that's what I was given I would sell it as best I could um, but it certainly in terms of just the college's resources would be a, a more difficult scenario to manage. Other questions from the board? I'm just going to say that um, I'm having trouble with the uh, scope of this project. Uh, two years does not appear to be temporary, nor do I think that that would be a finite, necessarily a finite ending of the of this use. Um, and the then board five years ago did consider this very carefully. That was that was uh, generated at that time would appear to be much more appropriate and would be useful for the college on a long term basis. Uh, which I expect that the temporary lot will become after a couple of years, and they will have received uh, a change in use there for that stripped down parking lot, which will become the, the, the standard. My concern, and I understand your concern coming from the college administration standpoint. You got to make, make more, yeah. no question about that. I understand that, but I don't think it's necessarily by cutting corners. And I fear that this project, uh, as proposed, um, is just that. And just in case it wasn't clear, if we did want to make it permanent, we would most certainly come back through the appropriate process um, at that time. Because at this point it is, even though I'm only in my first draft of the campus master plan, um, at this point it is in there as a contemplated possible use. Um, so at this point, I, what I, that, that's a good overview and we're getting our bearings with, with some of these questions. Um, what I'd like to do next is um, invite anyone else to testify who is here to do so. Just to make sure. You're under no obligation, I just don't want to forget you. So 
Mm -hmm. There is no pressure, just options. And, and you can always, later on, if there's something that comes up that you decide you want to speak to, we'll you can always come up to the microphone up here and, and raise a point then, too. Yes, we'll leave the microphone on. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I, what I'd like to propose that we do next, um, if there aren't any other questions, is to walk through the staff report. Oh, okay. Tom, do you have a question? No, no, if we're going to the staff report. Yeah. Um, staff report contains um, some items that we need to evaluate more and discuss as a board, and we have basis of information where we can start from that. So I'm just going to go in order and look at the things in red. Um, even though there are some larger issues, um, we will get them as we go. All right. So the first, um, the first issue raised is on page seven of the staff report, and um, it indicates that the driveway between the tennis court and Ridge Street is 15 feet long, and the question raised there is whether that provides adequate space for queuing during the arrival and departure times when most folks will be using this. Um, it's, our, it's up to us to determine whether that's sufficient to prevent queuing on the street for this size parking lot. Um, and so I want to know what folks uh, from the board uh, think of that, whether it's an issue. So the comments did, from did uh, DPW weigh in on this? They reviewed the whole thing and they had no issues with that part of the plan they whatsoever. Yeah. So do we agree that that 15 foot driveway is sufficient? Great. We accept the recommendation and advice of DPW. Very good. Um, then I will move on to the next section, which is. Um, page eight of our staff report, which talks about parking and loading areas. And it talks about the amount of parking um, with a certain number of spaces required per square foot of the use. And one thing I want to, um, to ask you um, is, we, we've got a couple different numbers for the amount of square footage that would be actually used by AOT. And I wanted to confirm with you while you're here what that is. Yes. Thank you. doesn't change the number of spaces, okay. um, but it does pinpoint the square footage. Great. And so the final number is? 50 spaces. 50 spaces, which means For about 30,000 square feet. It's 29,000, 44. Uh, 29,864. Did you keep one for yourself? I didn't. <laughs> Based on our formulas for parking requirements, um, that leads to a requirement for 50 spaces. Um, and the 22 spaces that are would be provided by the tennis court would be combined with 26 additional parking spaces through on other locations in the campus. Exactly. Okay, and it relies on other locate off street locations on right. campus. Okay. So um, one of the things that the board has um, the prerogative to do is waive some or all of the minimum parking requirements when there's a presence of transit within a quarter of a mile, which, which there is at this location. Um, but it seems like they're going to be meeting it anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not necessary. Is there a desire for a waiver? So a waiver is not being requested by an by the applicant. That's it. Does anyone else want to comment on the on the waiver? Very good. Um, so the next item that we uh, may wish to contemplate is um, a shared. Excuse me. Let me review this. Meredith, could you explain this part to us? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So the issue we have here is that the old tennis court area, which has been paved over to be a park, you know, for it to be client under the old parking area. So it's not like it looks like a tennis court anymore. I just want to keep calling it the tennis court. Um, so anyway, that is not technically on the same parcel okay. as the two buildings that will be using it. Even though it's all owned by the college, they are different parcels. 
um, divided by a what is for most of its length, all of its length there, a private street. Bridge Street there is private, okay? But it is it divides two parcels. So technically, the off-street parking is on a different parcel, so you're supposed to have a shared parking plan in place, right? Um, and to meet all the criteria of a shared parking plan includes things like um, that the agreement has to be between the owners and lessees for a minimum of 20 years, um, and that you have to um, supply sh plans showing the locations of the uses or structures for which the shared or offsite parking shall be provided. So in, in a sense, you'd be looking at needing to know exactly where all those AOT employees were parking, um, as well as having to be a 20-year lease. That doesn't, it doesn't really fit with this temporary request. But there, there isn't a clear sort of waiver for this. So it's, it's one of those things that it's a little tricky. So we are technically fulfilling the parking requirements of this use right. by sharing parking. Right. That's how you're getting the off-street parking, yeah. is by doing a shared parking. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an odd situation because, like I said, mm -hmm. everything's owned by the college. Right. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, well, it doesn't really come into play here, but remember that both the college and the tenant, who is a state of, state of Vermont, Vermont agency, do also both fall under 4413. Parking is one of the things you can regulate, but you can't, um, what's the term exactly? Uh, in, have the effect of prohibiting? Yes, prohibiting the functional use. Okay. So I don't know if that would fall into place here or not, but that all comes in. a temporary use the, the this discussion of having sort of a longer agreement uh, is important. Like it's just not there. It's just not there. And, um, and so I think it's it's appropriate to note it, uh, per particularly as we you know might want to think about a condition of making it clear that if, if this goes, you know, if, if, if there's a proposal for Considerations that went into the design and the review and approval process was uh, was substantial uh, with that with that concern in mind. So if we if we are talking about a limited time proposal, it needs to be a limited time proposal. Okay. So, Kevin, is that an argument in favor of some sort of agreement as required by the shared parking provision, or do you feel that the limited time could be captured in any permit conditions that are attached here. We, we could discuss that, I suppose, as we go through the okay. criteria. Okay. Well, and one, just going strictly to the shared parking issue, one of the requirements for the, under the new campus PUD provisions that the new master plan for Vermont College of Fine Arts will need to have, and there is a parking plan so a, a condition on this temporary permit could be that even if they don't intend to do it right away, that the, um, this area be included within that parking plan um, with, you know, that, that in a way is the shared parking plan. You know, if they throw in that this, this one area might be used for tenants and X, Y, or Z, Buildings or something like that. So you know what I mean? If the master plan expresses the shared parking plan. In a sense, if the master plan is going to express the shared parking plan, because it will have to lay out where all the parking lots are or, or could be, and then if they want to change that, they'll need to come back for an amendment to that PU, that campus PUD master plan. Um, 
it's just something to think about to, to cover the shared parking plan for future. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. I'm, I'm thinking of the shared parking plan as being quite explicit about how this particular tenant is mm -hmm. being served under this application. And so what I was envisioning is something that includes the tennis court parking as well as the uh, just a map identifying the specific other lot or lots where each number of spaces yep. would be accommodated. That could then feed into the master parking plan without um, without predetermining. Yep. Because what I heard earlier is that it's not conclusive that tennis courts will be part of the future master right. plan. That's true. And it could, we could put a condition on here that the agreement with AOT for where that parking is Issued, or would it be within you know X before the use commences? One of those yeah. items. Um, I think it would be before the before the issuance of the permit. Yeah, the same way that, that we would require a final site plan yeah. before issuing a permit. Does that does that make sense? So, I think so. So um, to illustrate how the shared parking will take place, it would be a map showing the tennis court spots plus the other where the other twenty six would be located. Yeah. yeah. Does that does that make sense to others? going to move to the next item in red, um, which is snow storage. Um, we've you've discussed, we've, um, you've, you've told us that snow is already stored. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, it would be helpful for us to have that on a map as well. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it can be the same map as the shared parking map, um, if, others, if others agree. Okay. Um, it's hard to imagine a time when there isn't going to be snow. Um, but <laughs> the um, it is one of the things that is not identified in the current application is potent is uh, barriers around the tennis courts when there's not snow, mm -hmm. and I wonder what what plans uh, have been discussed for delineating the parking. I'm going to leave leave aside the screening in particular and more just talking about delineation. Right. So um, the 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 space itself. Um, like the, the paved area pretty much demarcates. I, the one area that sort of bleeds into another area is where the tennis courts are connected to the basketball courts. Mm. Um, and so along that, um, that line, I could imagine um, cement barriers or something like just larger orange um, cones depending on When you say concrete barriers, are you talking about the type that might redirect a pedestrian when the sidewalk yeah. is closed? Yeah. So the ones that are about this the, long. The Jersey that. barriers. That's Jersey what they're called. Barriers. Jersey barriers. Okay. I thought that's what they were called, but I'm not sure. Um, but if that was, if that was not, I mean, I'm. We are open to whatever makes the most sense. Whether I was thinking of those orange barrel barriers, mm -hmm. um, something like that, could demarcate that mm -hmm. piece of where the cement doesn't clearly. Mm -hmm you know, that it, it continues from the tennis courts to the basketball court. Um, so I guess I missed it. There isn't, the fencing isn't still up between there's no the basketball fencing. and the tennis court. No. Okay, all the fencing got taken down. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the snow can go off to the side. Right now, the snow is the natural barrier, and I wouldn't well, imagine. Where does, just where does the snow go? Does the whole onto the basketball court? court, and then there is a, a it, the basketball court is not as long as the tennis yep. court area, so it goes on the basketball court and then sort of onto a part of the green. Okay. So, tell, tell us again, where, where would the Jersey barriers go? Can I do can yeah. I sure. So you're saying there's only one place where it's really necessary to delineate because there's any risk someone would nose over into yeah. the wrong area. Okay. 
And you're also saying those would need to be removed in order to facilitate snow storage. Right, Whatever right barriers now, would have to be movable. Right. Okay. Other questions about those things? All right. Okay. Um, so we talked about snow storage. Um, we have talked about demarcation. Um, we've talked about some possibilities for what those berries could be, but not decided. We can do that in a minute. Um, the, we're moving into the site plan. Oh, Tom, did you have something? No. Okay. Um, so we're on 12 of the staff, page 12 of the staff report, moving into the site plan standards. So there's a, a threshold um, question that's been raised by staff about whether this is a major or a minor site plan application. Um, Meredith, would you like to speak briefly to that, your recommendation yeah. and why? So um, one of the um, criteria that can trigger a major site plan review is construction of more than 10 new parking spaces or 2,000 square feet of impervious surface. And because, I mean, yes, you're, you're using this space asking to use this space for more than 10 parking spaces. But there's no creation of new impervious surface. You're, it's not, you're not constructing anything. And so my analysis was that this would be a minor site plan. So but te technically, it's more than 10 new parking spaces. So it was just, it was a question for you. Yeah, if you're basing that upon the fact that this would be a temporary use, um, not even just that there's nothing there's nothing being constructed that's that was the language I was looking at you know this because this line literally is construction of more than 10 new parking spaces or 2,000 square feet of impervious surface there's nothing being constructed right now so it seems to me that reviewing this under major site plan doesn't seem to me sense because major site plans some of the big things that are triggered by that review are um, you know, where am I uh, to, 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 you know solar access and shading and energy conservation we're not dealing with with anything where we're going to you know deal with impose on those items you know architectural standards that's triggered by major site plan it doesn't seem to make sense to apply that here um, You know, street trees, mm -hmm. that's not something that we're dealing with here. That's something that would be triggered under major site plan review. It just didn't seem to make sense to call this major site plan review when you're not constructing anything new and all the things that are triggered by that wouldn't apply here anyway. It seems sort of by default. So I, I would agree that a very strict interpretation regarding construction would put this in the minor category. Um, I want to know if others have opinions about whether the fact that we're changing the functional use of this space uh, would be of enough concern to rise to the level of major. Because okay. it, it's built right now, right. but it's not being used as a parking lot. So that's the change we're seeing. I mean, one could make an argument that there are substantial changes taking place not based upon the fact that there's a construction project, but like this visual acuity provided by this new project uh, could be of, of such a, a nature that it would rise to a more alarming level. Whether or not that fits into a uh, major versus a minor application is a question. Well, sure and that's, that. and since it was, since the surface parking is a conditional use here, it felt like a lot of those concerns were already dealt with under the conditional use analysis. But, like I said, it's... So we could address the, pri the relevant criteria. I, I think so. I don't think there's anything under major site plan that matters so much as the things under the conditional use review. But that's my opinion. Okay. I don't get a vote. But thank you for your opinion. <laughs> um, anything else folks want to say about major versus minor? If not, we'll continue with this as a minor. Or, or make a determination. I don't think that the, uh, the minor versus major designation is particularly uh, necessary. 
Thank you. I just wanted to make sure to get to that point because it was in red. I take very seriously red text in a memo. So if you ever want to get my attention, that's how you do it. Um, okay, so um, we're going to go through now the site plan standards and then we'll move on to the conditional use standards. Um, access and circulation has to do with how people get around, whether they're on bikes or on foot. And uh, the staff comment is that pedestrians would benefit from a crosswalk or other signal to drivers that the pedestrian traffic across Ridge Street has increased. The board may wish to condition any future extension of the use past the temporary end date on such being installed. Um, is, is, uh, is a crosswalk something that can be added to Ridge Street? Is this sort of a Ridge and West? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, well, so this is. My you know, Ridge Street, where I'm seeing where I'm seeing the AOT employees crossing to get from this parking to their building, mm -hmm. they'd be crossing Ridge Street, which mm -hmm. right now is a private road owned by the college. And at one point, fairly recently, it was closed to the public. That's right. right? There was no throughway there, but yep. right now it's a throughway. Mm -hmm. I mean, not throughway, but you know what I mean. There's through traffic, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so this was more of a. You know, I think that the current application meets the standards of Section 3202 as it is right now. Like I said, this is more of a concern when we hit beyond this temporary okay. use. And it's, right. I mean, it's something to discuss. Mm -hmm. You've got more people potentially now crossing Ridge Street, um, and there's no, there's, there's no crosswalk there. I know that, that that was something that was the old master plan contemplated something. So it's just something Rob. Is um, Ridge Street two way or one way traffic? Two way. Okay. Yeah. And, and there is no stop sign on West Street, is that correct? They've at actually that, added one. There at, is. at that corner? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the cars will be stopped at West, they'll be stopped on Ridge. Um, how about the other side um, of Ridge Street? Do they have a, a, a stop sign as well as there? So cars coming down from College Street? Yeah, uh, down College Street, yeah over towards Ridge Street? There, there is no stop sign there. Okay. All right. I, I would propose that we not condition future extensions of the use one way or another. I think that when and if that comes before this board, it will be a part of a bigger plan and we will know different things than we know now. So we shouldn't try and predict that. Okay. So, so, so uh, Kate, Kate, what was, you're, you're suggesting that we not, to tell me, just sure. say what you said again. Sure, thank you. Um, I suggest that we do not um, require the addition of a crosswalk at this time. Okay. No, I'm fine with that. Okay. And Others? This, and this wasn't something that DPW brought up. Okay. This was something in my analysis. No, thank you. It's good. It's good that we're looking at it. Okay. So, um, moving on, the the landscaping requirements under site plan review are only triggered for major. So we are moving through them. Um, um, some of them are only triggered okay. by it. And yeah, that's the having to have a landscape plan by a okay. professional. Landscape architect, plant materials. Okay, so are we now to item F, 3203G, yep. site landscaping requires one shrub for every five feet of building perimeter and one tree for every 30 feet of exterior, principal building exterior. So this is our fun landscaping provision that we keep revisiting because there's no waiver for previously approved site plans or you know prior development where it triggers the entire site plan to be analyzed. Okay. So you remember this is the one tree per f X number of feet of building perimeter, et cetera. really didn't fully contemplate where there was no change to the building. Um, you know, how, how it and we, as a board, used our discretion um, to uh, not apply those rules. Right. The 3023G rules. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those uh, rules are being changed. Hopefully. In, in it's, the, it's supposed to go before City Council. 
Correct. Yeah. So that's really for people who want to take care of their business. It's been a problem for us and And the, similarly, there are requirements, related requirements for trees to shade parking areas that for the same reason may not attach here. Um, however, we have, as a, would you like to discuss landscaping further now or under the conditional use criteria? Because we have, it has been raised that, that screening of a, of, a, of a use, even temporary, however temporary it ends up being, um, is, is a concern in, in terms of compatibility with the neighborhood and just overall visual impact. Um, we can discuss this further under conditional use review or we can um, talk about it now. Well, I think that, I think that it, it has a place in both lease reviews, both site plan and conditional use. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly, uh, what we have gone through the criteria, I want to make sure that we are talking about the landscape Okay. okay, we will be sure to do that in the next section. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we do recognize as a board um, from previous experience and just discussing this tonight that, that screening may, may be appropriate and needed um, for this. All right, so um, what we are doing next is we're looking at um, page 17, item 26, section 3303 of our regulations, and that is traffic. And what this does is make sure that a development doesn't have an undue adverse effect upon traffic in the area. Um, the testimony submitted is that there'd be 20 additional cars in this area of campus arriving in the morning between 7 and 9 a.m. and departing between 4 and 6 p.m. And um, it's noted here that the 20 additional trips is based on the increase of this one project that we are contemplating not the total number of AOT employees who may be parking in other spaces, but this is what is before us. Um, the testimony from, or the submission from the applicant is that there will be no measurable impact. Um, we do have the option of requesting a traffic impact study uh, using the board, our discretion as a board, even though it won't be more than 50 new trips. Um, we do not have any comments from DPW expressing concern about no, this. There were there were no concerns traffic. about traffic or this this use as a as a parking lot when it comes to the traffic from DPW, the chief of police. Neither of them had any issues, um, okay. especially because, because of the recently added stop sign. Okay. Um, do any board members have questions or concerns about traffic? Okay, very good. I forgot to note that we have moved into review of conditional use standards now. Um, traffic was a conditional use standard. And the next one is um, the character of the neighborhood standards, which is a standard that the proposed development shall not have an undue adverse effect upon the character of the neighborhood. Um, so this includes architectural compatibility, which is not, not applicable because this is not a, a building. Um, but then it also includes yards, lot coverage, and landscaping. Um, New development shall maintain a sense of open space appropriate to the neighborhood by balancing the size of the foot building's footprint with the mass of the structure on the lot. This does not mean a new development can't reduce the total amount of green space, rather the balance of building area to open space. Um, so this is not about a building going up and compromising green space, but it is about a use being put into place that changes the interaction between that use and the green space that current, currently exists. And so I think this is the um, most appropriate place to, to discuss some sort of landscaping. Um, we, I think, have an opportunity to minimize the visual impact through the choice of barriers between the tennis courts and the basketball um, court. Um, I think maybe orange barrels would not minimize the visual impact. Um, whereas movable concrete planters could perhaps be an option. I'm thinking, this is my own idea, and I, I would love others to, to share their thoughts. Thing, Were you thinking about the post office? I was, I was thinking about the post office. We were thinking about the post office. So, um, so this is, I'm sure there are other, other models, mm -hmm. um, but that, that would be one of the two sides um, that, that should be contemplated for that. Um, that's one idea that comes to mind, but I would like to turn to other board members um, for ideas about landscaping and the needs. We also have talked in the past about reduction of glare. 
um, in these cold winter months where the lights are on when you're coming and going. So I'm, Kevin, go ahead. I'm concerned about the about this project. I'm concerned about what its long-term impact will be. I know it's being being billed as being a temporary temporary use, but temporary uses have a way of becoming permanent uses if not if not adequately uh, monitored and controlled. So I think to to me that's the key issue is if it's temporary, how are we going to make it truly temporary? And as far as the barriers that have been discussed so far, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sold on them. I'm certainly not sold on orange barrels. I'm definitely not sold on Jersey barriers. The planners in front of the uh, uh, federal building down on State Street, um, maybe slightly better, but only slightly. And I don't think it addresses the concerns that were that were um, articulated and addressed uh, five years ago when this project was before us at that time, or the board as it was constituted at that time. I could live with an adverse situation if it is of is if it is of a finite length, and there's enough conditions. Uh, conditioning within the decision pro uh, decision itself that would guarantee that uh, a maximum of, of whatever it would be 18 months or 24 months uh, and at which time the uh, th that use would must cease uh, unless there was a duly uh, uh, this was a landscape plan that was uh, duly uh, uh, took into consideration all of the um, factors that uh, would keep the neighborhood in the College Street area um, as beautiful as it is. And uh, so that's my concern. Uh, I, can, I can accept a temporary use if it's truly temporary. Mm -hmm. I really get nervous when I start hearing about these orange barrels and Jersey barriers and it's exactly what we worked hard not to, not to sanction last time, which I guess, because there is a cost involved, perhaps why the um, former tennis court sat there for this length of time. Um, so I, th I think that, that maybe there's a, a problem that has um, developed simply because it wasn't addressed appropriately some years ago. I just want to just briefly go over just the, the current landscaping there. Uh, based upon the staff notes, uh, there are three crab apple trees adjacent to the parking lot. And a staff's visit, uh, the entire parcel also includes five large trees and around 20 small or medium sized trees. Is that roughly what? Like around the whole green. Around the whole green. Do you just agree with that assessment? Three crab apple trees. Three okay. crab apple definitely are right next yeah. to the tennis courts. Okay. Um, there's actually another grouping of trees. I I couldn't tell you what they are. Yep. Um, which is on page 14. You can see um, yeah. that other grouping. It's kind of right next to the basketball court area. In that corner there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so those are the two. Um, areas of trees right next to the tennis courts and then uh, I couldn't tell you the exact number of trees around the green but certainly I, that sounds right within the oh. now I'm just taking a look here on the west on West Street yep. you've indicated here on the on your uh, map that you or way up here that the C portion designated C is nine yep. feet eight inches wide and that is from the Sidewalk to the edge of the of the paved area, correct? Correct. Are there any trees exist or shrubs existing in that area no. all along West Street in that strip, that nine foot eight eight inch section? No, not Nothing. currently. No. Would you be amenable to having a condition that shrubs be placed there to help screen and shield off uh, the view of the cars in the, in the, you know, from neighbors and, and, and you know, to keep the character of the neighborhood? 
I wouldn't be opposed to considering it. Uh, I would love to talk a little bit more with my landscaper just about um, what would do well there. Yeah. Um, it's you know I don't want to put something in that's that's not going to um, thrive. Yeah, I mean, it, w it wouldn't be like you have to put in, like, this sort of, you know, shrub or this sort of thing. It would be left to discretion that as long as it comports with design, uh, yeah, as long as it's, you know, not a, you know invasive species or whatever, be able to rules. Uh, but what's with that? Something that, you, that the college would be amenable to, to have, like, shrubs along there? I would need to go back and talk to people about yeah. that, but I imagine Obviously, you can't plant them right now, but sometime when it's right. available. Right. Correct. Well, can you describe where, where I don't understand where you're suggesting? That sure, the sure. Site so, uh, on the proposed site plan. So, it's right along the. Uh, yeah, the along West Street there, there's a strip of, uh, if I see here, that follows right along. Yeah, the plan I was looking at, it looks just awfully skinny. Okay. So it says that it's yeah. nine feet, eight inches wide. So yes. Which I think sufficient amount of space for okay, sure. right. and it appears that it, it goes you know uh, the length of B which is about 109 feet presumably longer too because of the, the basketball court there. Yeah. Okay. And if it reverts to a uh, tennis court it's still appropriate to have some shrubs there. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's not going to be tennis again but you're <laughs> absolutely correct. It would not get in the way of tennis. So just for a little orientation in case you missed it in the description of materials um, the actual items from the applicant end once you hit the second BCFA design item. Everything after that are materials that staff supplied. Okay. Um, and I'm going to actually give you. Can you I, guess? I have that. Do you have the attachments? I think so. Um, so this. So everything after the, the current BCFA proposal yeah. um, that starts with the Dina Bookmeyer Baker item, um, the plans after that are the plans under the old permit. So I included them in here for some history and some perspective mm -hmm. right. so that when you're looking there, you're seeing the, what the old landscaping plan was that was approved. So you can actually see where back in 2013, 2014, they approved adding some shrubs and fences along the area that Helen is discussing right now. Yep. And you know, this is a lot of times we don't look at those past permits, but in this situation, it seemed really appropriate to be able to give you that perspective. Well, the, these are questions we, you know, I guess I was the only person that was on the board at that time, but these these were the questions that we were asking uh, at the time. Yep. And. Uh, well. There was a, I mean, that's where this came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't design it. VCFA designed it, or their, their landscape architect designed it, but it would, the, the design was based upon the concerns of the board. Mm -hmm. Not just the board, there, were, there was a lot of community involvement at the time as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're coming to the end of the things listed in red, and regarding landscaping, I want to see if. A, a, Kevin's concerns and all of our concerns, I think, about a temporary use. Let me let me see if I can summarize, and please jump in. Um, so there is a concern that a temporary project can continue on or be rolled into a more permanent project, and the risk of that is that we have things that were intended to be temporary remaining. Um, it seems possible that um, any that there could be a condition on any permit that conversion of the parking lot to a permanent use at the college would require reapplication and the installation of permanent landscaping to be determined at the time um, to make to create that finite period that that has been raised um, yeah I mean can't you just put a deadline on this permit that the use has to expire by X un unless yeah. you know, I, and, and I any think continued use required a new permit right yes I think what I'm getting at is that any screening, which we'll get to, um, would be seen as temporary screening and reevaluated to avoid the gotcha. rollover effect. Okay. 
thank you. Um, I'm just trying does to, that make sense? I'm also trying to make sure it's something that I can write. write at the end. Okay. I'm trying to make sure it's something I can draft. Something that will make word. sense yes. to, to other people <laughs> and not just to me. Um, so the, I, I think at issue is a goal that any screening that is part of a temporary lot not automatically be considered the appropriate screening if the lot becomes permanent. And having some sort of condition that not only uh, has an end date for the temporary use yeah. in the permit, but further says, and when there's a reapplication, the land, the temporary landscaping can't carry over. It has to be reevaluated. It has to be reevaluated. Right. Okay. You're right. Okay. Yeah. So that brings us to the question of what what would temporary screening, what would constitute appropriate temporary screening? And we've had ideas for concrete planters, a la the federal building. We've heard concerns about those. Um, because there has been extensive work in the past on what's appropriate at this site. And we've also heard from you that you are not um, not able to commit at this moment to um, the types of planting suggested by Tom um, or, or the other pieces. So where I'm going with this is that I might propose requesting you to return with a proposed temporary landscaping screening with, with, with a temporary landscaping screening proposal. A proposal for temporary screening that may involve landscaping <laughs> on this site. Based on what you've heard, that could include shrubbery, as um, mentioned by Tom. It could include some sort of movable barrier between the tennis court and the basketball court that is prettier than a concrete planter that's three feet tall. Could you? How does this you're, you're, you're right on target from my perspective, Kate. And uh, I think that, that the college needs to do just what the chair has uh, articulated, which is to provide a temporary landscaping plan and not just assume that because it has the word temporary as part of the application that that means you get a free ticket on this one. Because you, you, need, you, know, you need to make it look like it fits. Especially if it's two years, if I may end. It, that, that concerns if, me, the two if years. Be, if between now and then you discover it's only going to be six months or eight months or whatever or a year, then um, then maybe this board would have a different feeling about it. But that, yes, it is. In, in, you know, something like a split rail fence that's movable with a bet with a, with a, uh, uh, with a platform that, that keeps it upright and doesn't allow it to be moved too easily uh, is a heck of a lot nicer than, than a Jersey barrier. Uh, but there, you can do a lot of things with wood. So and perhaps we could modify and say um, landscaping or screening, because we're talking about screening as much or more so than plants. Is that correct? Would that yes. capture? Yes. And, and it's not just screening to block view, but also as a definition of where the parking area is, right? Yeah. Both between the parking area and the green and the parking area and West Street, right? Yeah. We're looking along so that street. Define, define the, the boundary. Right. Define the boundary and also create, create a definition physically as well as for visually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just one question. I think Please. part of the reason why I hadn't given a whole lot of thought about what those things might be is because in in thinking about this Monday through Friday state office parking so that on the weekends and in the afternoons it's gone. There's literally no evidence of it being there. Um, so I just, just to make sure if, if, if we go down this road and I'm going to come back with a proposal, I want to make sure that um, it would be more agreeable if there was actually something there that demarcated it in a way, um, rather than it just when they're gone, it is it is exactly how it is right now. Does, does that make sense? What I'm asking? Are, are you asking yes. whether it's re necessary to remove those screening on Saturday and I'm Sunday? I'm assuming if I'm going to do screening, they're going to stay. And, and my goal originally, when I was contemplating yes. it, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., when they were gone, it would look 
like it does right now, gone. Right. There's right. no evidence whatsoever. Basically. <clears throat> um, so that, you know, for the neighborhood, for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. it, 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 well, there's uh, just those wins. Uh, and, and I'm, that, that is honestly just the way I was sort of looking mm -hmm. at it, but what I'm hearing from this board is that the way you need me to approach it is to say, how can we make some, whether it's screening or landscaping or barriers, so it's really clear where the area is in a way that. The, the one thing that we as a board have to be very careful about is not to get into designing projects. Yep, we can give advice, we can give you and our, that's what I'm looking for. our opinions, yep. um, our concerns, our fears, our whatever. Yep. Um, as far as what you want to propose to this board, that is between you and your and your college uh, colleagues. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, I think what, what this board is articulating uh, with regards to this project is is there's a concern, and that concern has to do with the fact that, uh, as you know, the uh, uh, the College of Fine Arts. Uh, Campus and particularly the green is is one of the jewels of Montpelier, mm -hmm. and one of the, what you don't want to do, what we don't want you to do, is uh, start encroaching on this in a way that uh, uh, just doesn't fit. Yeah. And yep. uh, as far as what type of screening you use, we're making suggestions. <coughs> Movable screening is probably a good thing, uh, but probably Jersey barriers are probably not. Right. And I, I want to make sure we're hearing your point, which is that originally you didn't come forth um, with something because you were thinking temporary, not just on a, say, a year basis, but also Monday through Friday it's up, Saturday, Sunday it's down, Monday through Friday up, right. Saturday, Sunday down. And you couldn't think of a screening that would accommodate that. Right. So I think what you are hearing from us, that you are correct, that you are hearing um, that uh, in lieu of that temporary uh, approach, would so prefer, would so much prefer the screening that it could stay up on Saturdays and Sundays too. Um, and we certainly hear, hear Kevin's arguments too about the overall character, which I know is, is a priority for many, including you. Um, so what I would like to propose um, is that we ask the applicant to please come back with a screening or landscaping plan as we've discussed for the purpose of delineating the parking area as well as minimizing the aesthetic impact. The other things that we've asked for to be represented are a, um, so that would be the, the first, what I just said would be the priority for the next meeting. If in addition you could provide for the next meeting a map showing how the shared parking would be distributed as well as um, showing where the snow storage space would be. I believe those are the things that we've discussed as needing, uh, as, as outstanding and needing to be shown. Um, the main, of, in the other areas that we've reviewed, we've determined, oh, Kevin, go ahead. I would just also uh, like maybe a little more definition on uh, what the college is thinking about a time frame for this. Thank you. Thank you, that would be useful, useful additional evidence. Um, we've resolved the other outstandings required um, in, uh, regarding minimum parking requirements, regarding traffic impacts, the 15-foot driveway, square footage being leased to AOT. Um, and so what I've just, the things I've just listed before are what we need to um, further evaluate this application. And I will, uh, I will move that, uh, per, per the chair's uh, enunciation of all those things. Um, can I just make a clarification? Take a clarification we, from Meredith. So we have to continue to a specific date? Yes. Continuing to February 4th, and do we need to confirm with the applicant that that is an acceptable time frame in which they can get this information? Or Thank should we you. continue this to the one after that? Thank you. Well, I, I will turn the question to you. Um, we can talk to you again as soon as uh, February 4th, which is our next meeting. Would that be sufficient for you? I believe it would be. Okay. So then a motion from the board to continue this meeting to a time and date certain would be in order. So moved. Tom seconded. Motion by Tom, second by Deb. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Any opposed? None abstaining. All right, thank you. We will you. see you February 4th, and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yep, thank you all. All right. Oh, okay. uh, do we have other business? Uh, no, just, uh, I just need to make sure that when we revisit this, that I mentioned the design review. Okay.
Okay. <laughs> Good. So, um, the other business, uh, we now know that our next meeting is Monday, February 4th. Um, are there any other announcements? Um, just a reminder that in addition to the continuation of the 36 College Street application, um, the only other item of business on that date will be DRB training. DRB training. the public is welcome to review and submit one. Yes, thank you, Meredith. That's, that's what I was going to say as well. Um, if you, This is the moment you've been waiting for to learn about the zoning, why we have it, how it works, how it relates to itself. I think it's going to be a great overview both for those of us who worked with it and for people who may be observing it from afar, but uh, tune in. Well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a project that's in, in process as well. I mean, there's uh, a lot of... Is the Planning Commission done with making revisions yet? No, no. So the uh, Planning Commission is currently working through the rest of the hit list of items that need to be addressed, which is so more... Come back to it again. Yeah, which is more, uh, you know, an and needs to be an or, or there's something that is clearly a, a, a typo or something that would easily fix. So Some of the issues have to address. Yeah, so the Planning Commission... Oh, according to the... Yeah, well, the Planning Commission addressed them. Um, yeah. They've been bumped on the city council agenda to I think February, mid to late February, because of other pressing matters. But um, yeah, they're being addressed. Perhaps we could get a, a, a brief update on that if it fits in on February fourth. Though I, I realize as sense. is we might need to shorten up our training schedule even that day. Yep. All right. right. So I'll move we adjourn. Second. <laughs> Motion by Deb. Second by Tom. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.